So my name is Afan Ma. Um, I'm from the Martina Center at uh, Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And uh, today I'm going to talk about the computational modeling for multi-channel TMS systems. Um, but um, oh, sorry. before going, uh, sorry, I've got technical problem. Now, before going to the actual uh, uh, sort of like detailed material, I'm just going to uh, give a couple of uh, slides of, of motivation. Why are we doing this to begin with? So if you think about the sort of like moving the stimulation target within the context of, of TMS, why do we need the multi-channel TMS? What's the point? Uh, as you probably, most of you know, there are these really exciting uh, robotic TMS arms that can be used for positioning. And, and you could argue that this is the most accurate method that you could use. But um, in any case, if you're planning to move the target, let's say from the motor cortex to the auditory cortex or something like that, it's gonna take more more than a blink of an eye, it's gonna be probably like something around seconds. And um, furthermore, if you're planning to position multiple coils, it becomes kind of even more cumbersome and, and also more expensive because you would need to build a second robotic arm. So if you want to simulate either sort of like multiple target rapidly or two nearby targets, um, that might be difficult to achieve using this approach. So uh, the multi-channel system, on the other hand, tries to do that in a different way. So instead of using one coil or two coils or moving around, you basically try to build an array of coils and then you adjust the currents into the coils and try to synthesize the electric field hotspot by combining the fields of the multiple coils into the desired location. And if you're able to do this, obviously then you can quite rapidly shift both the target location and the orientation of the electric field so the pros system so everything works under the electronic control so it's relatively quick to move the the target around and of course uh, this would enable some kind of new types of tms paradigms to be implemented obviously if you take this approach and you sort of like try to build smaller coils for this kind of basic array approach uh there are always some trade-offs there's a lot of trade-offs in this talk uh Basically, if you start building smaller coils, you need more current to stimulate the brain. The larger currents will result in larger you know, amounts of heat dissipated in the coils. You need multiple stimulator units that is gonna add the cost. Obviously, the same is true for multiple robotic arms, but um, uh, it, is a, it is kind of like a con. And, and of course, the targeting accuracy will have some limitations because the idea here is that we will use the degrees of freedom offered by these 16 channels to shift the target around and shape the field. So obviously there are some limitations of what you can do and this is what we're gonna be talking about soon. If this was not yet convincing enough, um, there's another kind of like an argument that we presented. Uh, and this is basically, let's assume that you want to do TMS and fMRI. So everybody who is trying to do this kind of experiment knows that the way this goes down is that you take the subject and put them on the scanner table and then you position the coil to the best of your capabilities using the system that you have for positioning. And then you put the subject into the scanner and then you kind of cross your fingers and hope for the best. If the subject moves or the coil moves, there's really no way to reposition the, the coil. So that's another kind of, um, that's a kind of like a application where this electronic shifting of the focus would be very useful. And um, here's the two projects that we're working on right now. Uh, both have kind of like aim at building multi-channel TMS and imaging systems. The first one is trying to integrate the multi-channel TMS approach with uh, MRI, and the second one is trying to integrate it with MEG. I'm not gonna go into great detail about the project uh, right now. I'm gonna focus more on kind of on the, on the computational side. So here's the plan. Uh, first, I'm gonna go a little bit more into detail in the TMS array targeting and uh, this kind of follows almost like the chronological order that we've been doing these things uh, historically. So starting with the multi-channel simulations, then moving to the three-axis TMS coils that we've de developed and the multi-channel stimulators. There's a little bit of hardware stuff here as well, just to keep people excited and entertained. So it's not just computation, but uh, we're also kind of moving forward with the actual system um, uh, fabrication and then Going a little bit under the more into the computational realm, as you soon realize, this multi-channel TMS business is very much about modeling. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the high-performance computational TMS modeling, and then finally I'm going to give you the very latest work that we've been doing um, in trying to integrate this computational system with the hardware. So that's going to be like the very, very newest, latest stuff that we have. So moving on. So the multi-channel system really 
it's kind of an old idea. It was proposed in the 90s by uh, Risto Ilmoniemi and, and Jarmo Ruohonen. But um, so far, there are no whole head systems. Uh, there are a couple of systems under development, including our own projects. And then there's another project uh, uh, with the EU uh, uh, and, and Risto Ilmoniemi is leading that effort. But the idea in any case is the same. One way or the other, you use a coil array to try to shape the electric field, and the current in the different elements is adjusted to synthesize the desired field pattern. Now, from the mathematical or computational standpoint, it's, it's fairly simple what the, what the approach is. So you basically can provide a user defined target field pattern. This is kind of the field pattern that you would like to produce. And then, you can have a weight function for different regions. We here basically use the uniform weighting. And, and then you have the coil sensitivity E-field basis function. These are basically just the E-field profiles of each of the individual coils. And then you try to solve for the unknown current amplitudes that you need to provide to the coils. And if you discretize this equation, it becomes your standard kind of minimum or problem least square um, estimation and, and, and the pseudo inverse can be op obtained to, to get the, the currents uh, that you need to feed to the coils. So uh, what we've been doing to kind of get um, some kind of sense of how, how this system might be behaving and built, uh, we basically have simulated a lot of these kind of arrays in simple case, just a four by four array. And uh, we try to figure out kind of the spatial specificity, accuracy, and efficiency, and try to figure out what the trade-offs are. So there's, as mentioned, there's in, in every case in TMS, there's always trade-offs. There's lots of trade-offs in this business. But since this is all computational, we can do some quite interesting things like vary the coil diameter and the spacing cap, and then we go and, and compare the figures, figures of merit. So what are the figures of merit here that we're talking about? So basically this black arrow represents the target location and orientation that we would wish to stimulate. And then we can do the MNE, the minimum norm estimation, and we can calculate how far the actual field landed off of our target. And we can run this calculation for all the points under you know, the coil array that we want and, and pull out these, these metrics. And, and this is sort of like the old work that I've been doing quite some time. It's still on the submitted status, but how uh, we find to, uh, hope to find a, a good home for this. But I think since we are all computational, here today, it's, it might be a good, uh, interesting, a little, little background information, this multi-channel array design. So if we do this, we can start to see these interesting kind of maps where we can look at the loc localization error and the orientation error depending on what the target direction was. So here the target direction was kind of like from the, the let's say, bottom to the top left, right, and then the 45 degrees. And what you see first immediately clearly is that these metrics really depend on the spatial distribution, like where, where exactly you're looking, looking at. And obviously if you rotate the target 40, sorry, if you rotate the target 90 degrees, then the error metrics will also rotate by 45, 90 degrees because of that's the symmetry of the array. But if you look at the 45 degree angle here, then you start to realize that there are some points that are difficult to stimulate accurately. And same is true for the orientation error. And we can produce the same maps for the focality and the efficiency. And, and the kind of the take home message here is that these maps are not uniform. They have like a spatial dependency that we can then further analyze where this, where this comes from. And uh, finally, since we can do this really for as many coil arrays and coils that we please. We've here picked uh, four different coil diameters and uh, um, sort of like five different gaps. And each a different color plot here represents a different coil diameter. And then we basically extract the summary quantities from this central array region. And as you can see clearly here, there's the expected trade-off between the targeting efficiency and accuracy. So with the larger coils, the localization errors go up as well as the orientation error, but the, the efficiency kind of is the other way around. So efficiency is also highest, it is highest for the larger diameter coil. But um, having said that, this, this is not really meant to be the final quantitative numbers. This is kind of like more as a method that you can do to look into the details of how these error metrics kind of come about. And since, since we are doing this targeting computationally, we can, kind of dig a little bit deeper into the algorithms to try to see if there's something that could be improved. So what we noticed actually quite quickly is that the, the basic m &E or the least square sort of like pseudo inverse solution tends to produce um, um, solutions that try to make the field as focal as possible. And this results in a rather large current amplitudes for only like a few channels. 
But we can also solve the linear equation with explicit constraint on the current amplitude. So we can do like a constraint solution and, and we actually get almost as good solutions with significantly smaller currents. And we can do this in a slightly more clever way so that we actually use the unconstrained MNE as the first step and then we do the constraint optimization and that will speed up the convergence actually and then it works quite well. So here's an example of what does this mean. So initially we set the target to a certain location and certain orientation. We say we want the maximum amplitude to be 100 volts per meter and then we do the MNE and we get the realized field pattern. And now we take that pattern and use that as the target field and try to mimic that pattern, but now explicitly constraining the current amplitudes to be 25% less than the original one. And actually turns out fairly working fairly well. So as you can see, the currents more distributed across the channels, but the E field pattern is, is very similar. So, and now this, why, why this is really kind of interesting, at least to me, is that when we generate these quantitative maps, we can now sort of like compare A, B, what are the exact trade-offs? So as expected here, the efficiency for the constraint version becomes much more uniform. And where do we take the trade-off is basically in the focality. So the focality in some of these spots becomes worse, obviously because the E field becomes more spread because more, of the, more, more coils are used to synthesize the field. Whereas the, 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 the localization there is almost identical. Um, so that kind of concludes the section on on the, the computational background. So we've kind of taken this information from the computation and try to utilize this in, in the best possible uh, way to, to build the, the, the actual coils then. So here's one thing that we also, like most people, quite quickly realize that if you look at the individual simple circular coil, the, the field doesn't produce, um, the coil itself doesn't produce in any field in the center. So if you want to stimulate this spot, you kind of have to use the neighboring coils to produce the E-field there. And as you can imagine, if the coils become larger and or the coils become sort of like pushed more far, far away from each other, this will, it will be difficult to produce the E-field here. And also another point is that for any given coil, there's only a single orientation that the coil produces at any given point. So what we try to do is actually try to add some degrees of freedom to the array by kind of building a three axis coil. So we have, instead of just having one coil at any given location, we wind these coils in sort of like an interlaced way. So we end up having three coils per unit and uh, the E field uh, in, in, in the X and the Y coils, as we call them, the E field kind of nicely fills the blind spot here in the center of the Z coil. And if we combine the X and the Y coils, we can generate also the sort of like 45 degrees orientation. And um, if we look at the induced E-field patterns, we do realize that there's, again, this pros and cons. So the focality for the X and the Y coil is better. They're kind of inherently focal, but the efficiency goes down by 50%. Nevertheless, uh, whenever we are looking into this E-field, we should think about always what the whole array is kind of capable of producing. So even though it's, there's a hit in the efficiency, we kind of win in the packing density and the capability of adding more degrees of freedom. So here's some of other recent work where we actually fabricated this coil together with the Tristan Technologies, a company in San Diego. Um, so this is work that has been done by Lucia Navarro de Lara in, in my group. And um, so we've fabricated a coil with the simple air cooling that air cools in, it goes around the X, Y unit and then comes back around the Z unit and then goes out. We incorporated the temperature sensor and we tested this coil with the dedicated two channel custom made programmable TMS stimulator uh, uh, built by MacVenture. And um, what probably any sane person would do, I, I feel like that sometimes those kind of detailed maps of the targeting accuracy are kind of uh, much to handle. Here's a, like a more simple example of let's compare the efficiency and the focality. If we just put two of those basic Z elements side by side in a figure of eight configuration. And um, we basically simulated this with the realistic DIDT values that we got from the stimulator. And uh, as we can see here, two of the Z coils produce like equally strong E field as the CV6. They serve like the bread and butter kind of uh, large diameter coil, if you will. And if we compare to the cool B35 from MagVenture, which is sort of like the more focal coil, we see that the focality is almost the same. And of course, you know, there's no black magic or 
voodoo or anything here. The, the trick is simply that, of course, we're using two stimulators. Uh, we, we're driving each of the Z coils with an independent channel, so we kind of put in twice as much energy as well. Um, and that's all well and good, but then the second part that we wanted to check a little bit was what is the what is the heating? So as mentioned, the smaller coils need to be kind of more tightly wound with smaller diameter wire, and the natural thing is to try to look at how bad the, the, the heating situation is. So we basically used this air cooling approach. We injected air into the coil and gave a brief train of pulses, and, and then we look at the temperature rise. And, and as you can see from the graphs, especially with the air cooling, the coil heating is ball, uh, ballpark 0.3 to 0.5 degrees per pulse. But more importantly, with the air cooling, the, the temperature does return quite nicely back after a minute. It doesn't go exactly the baseline, but still we're kind of like, at that point, we're ready to kind of start another RTMS round. So with this simple cooling design, we're able to try a single pulse, spare pulse, and brief, brief turns of RTMS. Having said that, it's, it's fairly easy to try to make the cooling more efficient by using liquid cooling, but for the simple kind of like first approach, as well as our goal to try to use this inside the MR, we decided to go with the basic air cooling. So here's a sort of like a futuristic view of how this G-axis coil array might look like on an individual person. So um, uh, just, just the moving a little bit towards the more exciting simulations here. This is kind of an illustration of what we can do with the multi-channel coil array. So if we activate just one of these Y coils alone, it does produce a relatively focal field, but it decrease, decreases rapidly as a function of the depth. So if we activate the Y coil with two neighboring Z coils simultaneously, we can significantly boost, sorry, we can significantly boost the E field strength and depth penetration. And this is one thing that is really quite exciting to me is, is to the capability of like having this flexibility of, of shaping the field with the multi-channel coil array. And just very quickly, here's a sort of like a, a graph that illustrates our capability of, of, of using the multi-channel stimulator to spatially and temporally control the field. So here we try to make like a stepwise rotating field where we activate the X and the Y coil elements to produce this. So we programmed this in the stimulator and then we measured uh, the, the DBDTs and we extracted sort of like the X and the Y components and plotted them back to kind of verify that it nicely recapitulates what the, what the plan actually was. So with this, we're quite happy to see that, the, that both the coil and the stimulator construction works as expected and we are confident to kind of move on to the next, next step. And here's a, here's a quick sort of like illustration of what this does in the brain. So, we basically then pass this sequence in the computational modeling and, and we kind of model how the field should look inside the brain and and, and it does again show that we, we can produce this kind of stepwise rotating uh, stepwise rotating field whether this is particularly useful for any purpose remains to be seen once we kind of get to the first in humans but this again just illustrates the capability of, of this kind of array approach and um, now switching gears a little bit and going to the computational TMS modeling side. So this is kind of a stuff that has a little bit of uh, a spin-off. Uh, and, and starting from the historical perspective, we started this modeling uh, studies by just looking at what is the sort of like reasonable first order approximation that we could use. And here we use like a three layer boundary element model, DM and compared to the local sphere and, and the global sphere, meaning that the, the sphere is kind of either locally fitted or globally fitted to the inner skull surface. And here actually you can realize that for some parts of the brain, the sphere actually does a relatively decent job. So this doesn't include the CSF, but you know, there's the old joke about the physicist who is asked to design some housing for the cows and the physicist goes like, okay, well, let me assume that the cow is spherical and it has a diameter of one meter, but in this case, the old joke is actually kind of, it's kind of true that the spherical cow approximation is already pretty good. However, when we move to the multi-channel array system, it kind of becomes really clear as uh, the targeting is, is based on the electric field. So we, we calculate the electric field for each of the coils and we combine them and we try to stimulate a given target. So we really want to make sure that this computation is done as, as accurately as possible within a reasonable time. So the challenges with the traditional BEM is that the system matrix is dense and it kind of needs to be inverted, which makes the like 
in, including the gray matter and white matter surfaces with one millimeter resolution is not, not really feasible. And this is something we already kind of alluded in these old papers that maybe we could come up with the technique to accelerate this. But um, this is one of those things that is kind of like easier said than done. So it, 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 it kind of requires quite a bit of thinking how to, how to actually make this happen. So just to give a quick, even more simplified overview of what the physics is, I'm just gonna take a one minute side tour and, and try to like explain how this idea actually comes about. So in, in this case, we have a very simple system. We have the in, in, impressed E field and when you have conductivity, a, a difference contrast in inside and outside the object. Now, if we put the E field and the object in there, depending on whether the conductivity is larger or smaller, the current either gets sucks in, sucked into the, into the object or gets pushed out. Basically, the reason being that the electric current density must be uh, continuous across the boundary in the quasi-static uh, case. For the E field, however, what happens is that due to this uh, constraint of the current being continuous, the, the tangential component of the E field is continuous, but the normal component is discontinuous. And what causes this discontinuity is the charge accumulation at the boundaries. And if you look at this problem in this basic sense, that the secondary E fields are generated by the charges accumulating at the boundary. So if we can use a method like the FMM to evaluate these Coulombic E fields rapidly, we could potentially dramatically accelerate this method and make it work with large, large models. And this is exactly what then Sergey did. So as, as mentioned, this is one of the problems that is kind of easier said than done. So, Sergey took, took quite a while to kind of think about it and he, he thought about it and he thought about it and then he actually came up with, with the correct formulation and solution. And as a result, this is even all published, so I won't go too much into the detail, but as a result, we can kind of get the accuracy of a, a commercial grade finite element solver with the computational convenience and, and speed of the VM. And what this really allows us to do is to, is to take basically highly detailed models uh, with the convenience of the surface-based approach. And why I kind of personally like the surface-based approach is, is that we kind of spend all the effort in, in producing these surfaces from the, from the MR anatomical data. And uh, we try to make the surfaces are nice and smooth and, and correct. And then kind of why, why would we need to go back to the volume if we could come up with something that could work directly with the surfaces? That was kind of the motivating thinking here. Uh, and just to give like a quick, very cartoonish explanation of what happens is that basically you take the incident field from the coil alone and, and you calculate the surface charges, the, the charge accumulation at the boundaries with the boundary condition. Then you iterate this until convergence and you use the FMM acceleration here to speed up the computation. And once the solution converges, we know the, uh, the surface charge distribution of the incident E field, we can calculate the total E field anywhere in the surfaces or in the three dimensional space. And um, again, won't go too quickly into the, uh, too much into the detail, but we did do some comparison with uh, finite element solvers, including SIMNIPS 2.1.0. And the result kind of recapitulates the idea that, that for the large models where we have a large number of, of mesh points, the FMM acceleration really does do a good job in, in, in it, it has this kind of n log n scaling dependence with the, with the model size. So for the large models, it does seem to offer some advantages as well as calculating the fields very close to the boundaries. And having said that, the, the FEM based approaches have been further optimized and improved and, and they, uh, they work really great as well. I guess what I'm saying is that there are certain applications where one method might be preferably used, but they, in the end, they kind of produce the same results, which is great, which means that it's kind of, you know, every kind you know, you can pick the best tool for, for the, uh, whatever purpose you have. And we have mostly thanks to Sergey's recent effort. We have also put the first version of the toolbox available. So please check it out. It's a MATLAB toolbox. You can download it for free. And one thing that I like about it personally is that you can do quite flexible modeling of the TMS coils and using the tools and you can calculate the fields close to the coil, which is something that I like because I'm uh, also doing the coil development. So, so please check it out. And if you have any problems, you know, send, send us messages and we'll try to get started. And we'd really like to hear some feedback from the users as well. And uh, moving to the final part of the talk, I'm going to, 
sort of like give an overview of the very most recent stuff that we've done in putting together the computational neural navigation system for these kind of multi-channel TMS arrays. So here's our plan. This is the work of Mohammed Danishand, who is a postdoc in, in, the, in the team, and he's been figuring out how to kind of put the pieces together. So here's our flow chart. Um, everything as usual starts with the MR acquisition. So the initial visit, we collect the MR data, we generate the head meshes, sort of like inter-visit planning stage around the free surf, around the segmentation to extract the surfaces. And then we align the surface coordinates on the MR coordinate and we can define the target areas. And then when the subjects come in, we do the standard patient registration using the local neural navigation system. And we determine the locations of the 16 coils in the array. We pass these to the BM FMM engine in MATLAB. And then we calculate the basis set and we can use the MNE to obtain the current amplitudes that we need to stimulate each target. And then we pass this information to the MacVenture stimulator rack. Our current channel count as of now is 16. At least it was when we left the lab and we hope all the 16 channels are still there. So just giving a little bit more detail. So uh, this is the registration process that most people know. So we identify anatomical landmark using the stylus and go pick the same points in the MR images. And then since eventually the coils are fixed, so the coils are moved so that they touch the subject head, but after they're fixed, we basically just digitize the locations of the coils and then we can visualize the coil locations with the same navigator software as well. And then I'm gonna go and show you a quick video about what happens next. So then we can track the subject when it's positioned into the array and finally when the head is fixated and we can proceed with calculation of the e-field so we basically give the target and we determine the amplitudes of the current into the coils and we synthesize the e-field and obviously we can do this as as many times we like as many uh sort of like targets as we like and when we're done with all the targets we can save this list and we can basically communicate that to the stimulator unit. And then when we are ready to start, we can, we'll push the current amplitude to the stimulator and the stimulator will run this program either by triggered by trigger input or it will run the playlist automatically. And this is kind of where we are right now, but this represents our kind of like current take on this. And just to reiterate what really is the unique feature of the multi-channel arrays that that we can move the hotspot using this approach between the brain targets with, uh, with 100 milliseconds or less, like in the millisecond range. Uh, and this is really the unique feature of the multi-channel approach. And just to end the talk with uh, discussion. So what we're trying to do here in a more general sense is that we try to move towards the network level causal mapping. So as we all know, we have these fantastic imaging tools such as Diffusion MRI, functional MRI, and MEG EG, which will give us the connectivity network maps. But if we include the multifocal stimulation and imaging, we can start to also add the causal information that we can start to look at the causal relationship between the nodes in this network and also uh, use this for various purposes. So for the potential applications, we obviously we can provide some hopefully some new tools for basic neuroscience in the form of these novel rapid scanning uh, stimulation imaging protocols. But what I also personally like is this mouse click TMS target selection with the field modeling. So basically you can sit on your chair comfortably and, and just click on the targets and, and, and determine the, the stimulation pattern just automatically and then the, the stimulation rack and the neural navigation system will do the work for you. And of course, we hope there will be some therapeutic possibilities, fully individualized approaches with simultaneous dose response monitoring, especially I think for the TMS MRI, this would be quite interesting and useful to look at the concurrent uh, fMRI data while simulating multiple targets and, and look at the connectivities, as well as, as ultimately providing some closed loop approaches for, for optimizing the therapeutic efficiency. And with this, I would like to thank you and also thank the research team, my collaborators, our commercial partners, as well as the, the generous grant support. And, and I'll leave you with the final video of the steerable TMS targeting with tree axis multi-channel array.
Thank you, Apo, for the great talk. It's very exciting developments. A few quick questions from the audience. First, regarding the multi-channel stimulation and its um, time resolution. Uh, what is the time gap between successive pulses? Can you add capacitors to shorten it uh, to do some sort of paired associate stimulation? Yes, we, we, so we can actually do more than that. We can, we can switch between the subsets of the coils even much faster. So the 100 millisecond is something that we just decided to set for the first demonstration to kind of show that we can clearly do things faster than what any robotic arm together can be, uh, could be done. But we can really accurately control the timing of the independent channel. So if we just work with, let's say, mutually exclusive sets, we can really put the, so, so we don't recharge the capacitors. We, we, we can go into the microsecond level control of the stimulation in that case. Cool. Uh, and two questions about the multi-channel coil, so multi-channel coil array. Uh, first, uh, when you simulate your coil arrays, do you take into account the mutual coupling between the coils or do you superimpose the separate fields from each coil? So for now, that's an excellent question. So we've recently done some calculations as well as measurements. So for the three axis coil array, we've measured the mutual inductions between the X and the Y and the Z. And the reason why we actually designed it this way that the, since the coils are orth orthogonal, the, the inductance is actually the mutual inductance is pretty small. The coupling coefficients are sort of like the order of 1% or less. Between the neighboring units, we haven't really measured it yet. We have done some simulations and, and based on the fact that if we put a little bit of a gap between the coils, we expect to get the, the coupling between the units also to be a couple of percent. So we haven't really looked into that much yet, except for we have measured this for the one single tree axis unit. But um, there are methods that you can do to, um, to take this into account, but we have, we're not, to be honest, really quite there yet since we're still building up the system to have these array and then look at these in more detail. Yeah, there are a lot of things that can be explored here. And the final question, what is the depth of the field of the multi-channel coil in comparison to figure eight coil? What is the depth? Yes, uh, maybe so, a depth, uh, depth focality trade-off. Yeah, so we, Again, we ex sort of like fully expect to have this trade-off, but the nice thing about the multi-channel system is that if you're, it's up to you kind of, right? So if I would activate all of the coils to make it like minimally focal, I can make it go pretty deep, right? I can sort of like stimulate the entire brain, if you will. But um, in, in, in any case, it, there will be a similar, a similar trade-off. Like, like I showed in this figure, if you just activate one coil element, it's going to be very focal and it's going to decrease, decrease, decay very fast as a function of depth. Let me just pull that figure uh, right here. But if we combine the coils, you can see as it starts to go deeper. And if we kind of, if you imagine that we add even more coils, more coils, we can make it go deeper, but then obviously we lose the spatial specificity. So the same kind of trade-offs apply as, as for conventional TMS coils.